Well, good evening, everyone. Hey, didn't Pastor Josh do a phenomenal job here tonight? I really need to become very friendly with Pastor Josh because my second eldest daughter, Kasia, is dating his son, Phoenix. And Pastor Josh's last name is Blackford. And so I was driving Kasia the other day, and I have a black Ford Edge. And we were driving along, and she said, Dad, 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 isn't this a sign? I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? She said, we're driving a black Ford. She said, it's meant to be. I'm going to marry Phoenix Blackford. Amen. So it's pretty neat. Lastly, before I get into my message tonight, by the way, we want to welcome everyone online. Pastor Harrison, who was leading in worship tonight, it's his birthday tomorrow. And would you all just with me say, happy birthday, Pastor Harrison. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Pastor Harrison. Let me tell you what. I've been working with him for the last two and a half years. And every Sunday, he shows up anointed, full of God, prayed up, filled up. He leads our team in a wonderful way. Would you give Pastor Harrison just a hand of appreciation? And I feel that way about all of our campus pastor worship leaders and all of our campus pastors. Speaking of campus pastors, last Wednesday night when Pastor Dave Ansel was here, I've known Pastor Dave probably 20 plus years. And I'm telling you right now, this is a major win, not only for our Scottsdale campus, but for our Dream City team to have Pastor Dave and Tracy, his wife, agree to leave their church in California and come over here and be a part of what God is doing here. And he did a phenomenal, phenomenal job last week with his truth bomb. Can somebody say amen? So this is the fourth week in our truth bomb series. There'll be one week left. Next Wednesday night, we'll bring it to, conclu to a conclusion. And I just got some uh, random thoughts. Usually my thoughts are pretty random that I want to share with you tonight. Some quotes to begin. Charles Spurgeon, who was known as the prince of all preachers, said this, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. That was said approximately about 170 years ago without the modern technology of the world being so interconnected through social media and every other method. And if it was true then... How much truer is it today? Right. And it's amazing how quickly lies and all kinds of things can spread, and yet the truth just seems to, at a snail's pace, at least from our perspective, right, sometimes moves along. George Washington said this, truth will ultimately prevail where there is pains to bring it to light. And we have to contend for the faith. We have to contend for the future. We have to contend for the truth. Just because we know the truth doesn't mean that it's just automatically going to prevail. We must embody those things. We must express those things. We must contend and defend those things. Can somebody say amen? amen. The Bible says in John eight thirty two, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. And though I don't want to digress into a deep explanation of this, this word knowing in the Greek New Testament is not just an intellectual exercise. Oh, I know that. I can quote it. I memorize it. I know where it's found. It means a knowing that only comes through experience. And the truth that will set you free is the truth that you live in and you live out day by day by day. Tonight, I've decided to give my message an unusual title, and I had a hard time putting this message together over the last couple of days. I mean, it's hot off the presses. I just finished it yesterday afternoon, and I was still tweaking it again this morning. But I've called it Golden Calves, American Idols, and My Truth. Golden Calves, American Idols, in my truth. My truth is one of those phrases that should be reconsidered by those who use it. You have likely heard, this is my truth, or know your truth. We should stop saying that. You may have to catch yourself because it's one of those phrases that has caught on. One of those phrases that people use without even knowing why they are using it. And in a culture where there is no objective truth, and everyone is free to define what is right for themselves. Where 
do we end up? If you were to look at my Netflix subscription and the regularity of the kind of choices that I make when I'm viewing Netflix, there's not even a close second compared to the documentary. I'm a documentary junkie, especially history. And I've watched dozens and dozens of documentaries on the World Wars, especially World War II. And I'm fascinated with it uh, on so many different levels. And I've read a number of books on it, and, and one of them had to do with Hitler's cross and what was happening there on the occult side as he was coming in, and it was fascinating. And just two days ago, there was, there was a question that was posed that who was the greater order, Winston Churchill or Adolf Hitler? And they said, sadly, we hate to say this, but it wasn't even a close second. And in a, it was amazing to me that in some of the books that I read, there were people that conscientiously were objecting to the Nazi ideology, and they would go to the Nazi rallies, and by the end of the rallies, they were there with everyone else because it was so hypnotic in what was happening. And there was, there was definitely an, an element of the occult. But as it relates to my truth, this is exactly what the Nazi lawyers tried to claim in the Nuremberg trials, that they were just living out, think about this, they were just living out the ideology of their cultural beliefs, and therefore, the rest of the world could not condemn them. Think about that. They're like, you have no right to judge us. We believe that the Jews are the scourge of the earth. And because that's our cultural belief, you have no right to judge us. Now that is on the ultimate horrific outcome of my truth. And if my truth sometimes is left unchecked, we could end up there again. Now there are other things that have to do that relate to my truth that I just got to tell you flat out that I just don't get. That they're so outrageous. I'll give you an example. Back at the end of January, I joined a couple of thousand people from Dream City Church as we went on the stop traffic watch. And we were walking around that sports complex out in Glendale. And I saw this person in what I thought was to be, and put this next picture up of this tiger, what I thought was to be a mascot. And I asked one of my kids, I said, I wonder what, what school, I wonder, is, is that a mascot for? I'm not familiar with that particular mascot. And they're not like, Dad, come on, yeah, we know you're kidding. I'm like, what, what, what? They're like, that, that's not a mascot, that's a furry. I said, what? They said, yeah, that, that's a furry, that's a person who believes that they're an animal and they identify with this animal and therefore this is how they go to class, this is how they go through life, this is how sometimes they show up for work. And I say, wait, 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 wait. is this America's uh, funniest videos? And I say, you gotta be kidding me. And yet, this person believes, and if you're a furry here tonight, we're not on the same page, man. <laughs> Just straight up. <laughs> and I'm like, you, 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 you. Ugh. And I thought, well, they may be furry, but they're supporting the stop traffic watch. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought about it this week as I put this message together, and I found myself very surprised where I felt the Holy Spirit was leading me in terms of preaching through this. And I want to take us tonight to Exodus chapter 32. And in here, we're going to find a golden calf that really represents American idols and ultimately this whole concept of my truth. So Exodus 32 verse 1. When the people realized that Moses was taking forever and coming down off the mountain, they rallied around Aaron and they said, do something. Make gods for us who will lead us. Think about that, just that one statement. Make gods for us who will lead us. That Moses, the man who got us out of Egypt, who knows what happened to him. So right out of the gate, now let me give you the context. Moses takes his assistant, Joshua, 
they go up and Moses ultimately meets with the Lord and it's here that Moses is, receives the Ten Commandments, but it's not that God dictates them to Moses and Moses is writing them down. They are carved out of, sta- out of, uh, out of the rock by the very hand and the finger of God himself. And Moses receives the two tablets, he receives the Ten Commandments, but some time has passed. He's up there for 40 days initially, and people left to their own devices, they got bored, they got disinterested, they got doubtful, they got all kinds of things, even though, here, you got to consider this, these were the same people that watched the ten plagues unfold before their eyes. That at one point, there was two or three plagues that were very similar that happened to the Egyptians and to the Israelites. Then God himself, if you read earlier in the book of Exodus, God says, I'm going to make a distinction. Among them, for example, when there was the plague of darkness, the Bible says there was a light on in Goshen, which was where the people of God lived. And at different times, with different plagues, everything was happening to the Egyptians in a negative sense, and God's people were well protected. That in itself was to say, wow, God is for us. And God ultimately provides them with the exodus and he leads them out, leads them through, takes them across the Red Sea. They see the the, the 600 plus chariots and the armies of Pharaoh basically swallowed up as the sea kind of returns to its place. And basically, they, they, they are free and unencumbered from that opposition or from that past adversary. And it's, it, it's incredible. But Moses goes on, on, on this hike with God, and he goes up the mountain, and it's taking forever. Let me just say this. Sometimes, with God, it takes time. And I, I'm like anyone else. And I'm, I'm in, actually at the front of the line in terms of being impatient. If a light is turning green, and you're in front of me, and you don't go, there's a chance that I may lose the joy of my salvation. Maybe, just maybe, because in my book, green means go. Can I get an amen? I'm impatient. Don't ever pray for patience. That's a mistake, because God will place you into situations that are going to require patience. and You're going to end up hating life, amen? But it was taking forever in their opinion. So they go to, of all people, They go to Aaron, the brother of Moses, the right hand of Moses, who ultimately becomes the first high priest for God. This is the guy that they go to, and I can't believe that Aaron kind of buys into it. They go to Moses' brother Aaron, they're like, this is taken forever. Make gods for us that will lead us. And so there's two things here, right out of the gate. Number one, there's a rejection of God. Because even though they were eyewitnesses, it wasn't just some tradition or some story, even though that could have been authenticated, but they were eyewitnesses that saw it in Egypt, that saw the power and the wonder and the the majesty and the might of their God who was rescuing them from that that blast furnace from the Egyptian taskmasters and Pharaoh himself. And it was the most powerful planet on the uh, earth. a country on the earth, and he was the most powerful man. It was the superpower of the day. And God humbles him, and brings him basically to his knees. And yet, they're, they're so quick to say, well, oh, this is taking forever. We don't know what happened to that dude, Moses. They don't even have the respect. So they, 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 they have a rejection of God himself, and then they also have a rejection of the man of God. And again, I don't want to fill in all the blanks for you, but think about what's happening today. Think about that. Because wouldn't it, hey, I took my American citizenship test. I had to study my American history in order to go in and take that out, and I learned so many things. And undeniably, undoubtedly, this country was formed and fashioned, and it was given a foundation of godliness. And yet, and yet, we are that country, and yet, Could it be said today that generally speaking, I'm not talking about the body of Christ, but generally speaking, the people of America saying, man, this is taking forever. We don't know what, we don't know what happened to that Moses. We don't know what happened to that move of God. We don't even know if that is really our history. And there's all this history 
revisioning that's happening. So reading on, Exodus 32, 2 through 4. So Aaron told them, take off your gold rings and from the ears of your wives and your sons and daughters and bring them to me. They all did it. They removed the gold rings from their ears and they brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from their hands, cast it in the form of a calf, shaping it with an engraving tool. And that's important. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. The people responded with enthusiasm. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Tell me if that doesn't sound like America today. That even though the blessing and the favor and the face of God has, has been shining upon this country from its inception, how quickly after generation after generation getting further and further from God, saying we don't even acknowledge that God anymore. Here's what brought us out. And I, 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 one of the documentaries that I'm watching right now, it's called The Cars That Built America. And I just finished the one, the segment on Henry Ford, how he really, in many ways, because of the advent of the assembly line and how that went into production for the cause of the Second World War, really, and you could, you could make the argument that it wasn't just the fighting forces that were fighting on the beaches of Normandy or uh, over in Japan and, and everything else that was happening in the Philippines and in, 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 in that area of the world, but... Really, you could, you could make a very strong argument because of the ingenuity and the innovation of the assembly line in many ways that really won the war. Watch the documentary. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just telling you these are some of the takeaways that, from what I'm watching right now. And yet, if we're not careful, we can fall into the very same category as these people who saw God move on their behalf and part the Red Sea and cause them to come out on the other side free and delivered uh, from all of those past bondages and everything else and say, you know what? It was by our own intuition. It was by our own enterprise. It's because we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and got it done. Oh, no, we didn't. And we thank God for the innovations, and we thank God for the creativity, and we thank God for, for, for that, that we live in a capitalistic nation, that, that there's something, there's an incentive to grow your business and be all that you can be. I'm all about it, but let's not replace God with giving credit to ourselves. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Their celebration was built on their self-deception and their idol worship of their truth. So what's happening now? Moses is up there. And he's on the mountain. Aaron, his brother, the high priest, who showed up. Every time Moses went into the court of Pharaoh, Aaron was right there with him. In fact, Aaron was there because Moses initially, he's like, I, I don't speak that well. And then the Lord says, it's earlier in Exodus chapter 4, I believe, where the Lord says, I can't believe you're... I know what I'm doing when I'm calling you, but if you insist, I'm going to have your brother meet you, and I know that he speaks well. And Aaron was always beside, so now Aaron is forming and fashioning this golden calf out of the melted down earrings and rings and everything else. And yet, while Moses is there, he's thinking, man, I'm coming back with these tablets. I'm coming back. They were carved by God's hand himself. They're coming down off the mountain, and Joshua is like, man, I don't know what I hear. There's something going on down there. I, I don't know. What, what do you think it is? And Moses says, it's not the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's something else altogether. And when they get down there, they are enthusiastically, basically, worshiping this, this golden calf. And Moses, his mind is just torqued, and there's a lot of things that happen. But I want to pick up the story when he finally says something to his brother. And in Exodus 32, 21, he says, what on earth? Did these people ever do to you to make you do this? They, did they beat you up? Did they threaten to kill your wife, to take your children? What, what, they must have done something because of all people that would reject any suggestion to create a God when you were right there with me every time we confronted Pharaoh, every time there was a miracle, every time there was a move of God, every time that God showed up and God spoke up, you were there. Of all people, you would be the last person to ever give in to that, and yet, so Moses is like, what on earth did they ever do to you? Aaron said, Master, don't be angry. You know these people, how they set, 
how, how, how set on evil they are. They said to me, make gods who will lead us. And this Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. So I said, who has gold? And they took off their gold jewelry. They gave it to me. I threw it into the fire. And there's something about this verse that just rattles my cage. He says, I, I, I'm not really responsible, Moses. Look, I just threw it into the fire. Out came this calf. I, you know, I, I, I barely participated. I barely compromised. I barely gave in to their demands. I just did enough to kind of satisfy them. I collected their gold. I put it in the offering. I chucked it into the fire. I stood back and, can you believe it? Look what came out. But didn't we read earlier that it was Aaron who took an engraving tool, who formed, depending on what version of the Bible that you read, it'll say he formed it. He fashioned it. He's the one that created the shape of it. He's the one that perfected it. He's the one that polished it up. He's the one. Boy, if that doesn't sound like a cultural condition today. It's like, I, I can't really be held responsible for how my life is going or how my marriage is going or how, how my career is going, how my walk with God is going. Because I'm barely participating with some of these things, you know. I'm just trying to keep the peace. And I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I collected some things, but I threw them into the fire. And much to my surprise, it had nothing. My handprints are not on that whatsoever. You won't find my fingerprints. Huh. I can tell you in 30 years of ministry, there are so many people, so many couples that Renee and I have counseled with, that when we sit down with them in the hopes of reconciliation, the hopes of restoration, of hopes of kind of reuniting a family and getting them back on a solid path and, and, and to be following the purposes and the promises of God for their lives, you'd be surprised, sadly, and shocked and dismayed at how many people said, listen, I really didn't, really didn't do anything. I, I threw it into the fire and out this came. And yet their fingerprints are all over it. All over it. If we're going to be the people of God, we need to take responsibility for our actions, for our behaviors, for our choices, for the way that we conduct ourselves, for the way that we live our lives, for the way that we witness our faith. We need to be responsible people. If you read about the parable of the talents, where one is given five, one's given two, and one's given one, the one who's five, he turns it into ten, the one that has two turns it into four. In the New Living Translation, that's the version, third time I'm reading through the New Living Translation. And again, I'm a word guy. So words jump out at me. In a lot of versions, they say, you know, uh, you've done well, well, good, thy good, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. But in the New Living Translation, it says, well done. Now I'm going to give you more responsibility. You know how you're graded in terms of your faithfulness? You're not given less responsibility. The higher you go with God doesn't mean that you can slack off and just kind of phone it in and get other people to do it. The more faithful you are, the more fruitful you are, the more responsibility you're given. See, that's not a real popular message in this feel-good gospel that is kind of going from coast to coast. Thank God we, we, we work and we live and we thrive in a cultural climate here at Dream City Church from our senior pastor on down that understands and recognizes, listen, I, hey, there, there's a part that God has to play, but there's a part that I must own. And I've got to take responsibility for my life and for my family and for my faith and for my future. Can somebody say amen? I'm preaching better than your amen in, but that's okay. Almost done, almost done. Hang with me. Thir Exodus 32, 25. Moses saw, look at this. Moses saw that Aaron let the people get out of control. Now notice this. Oh, does this not sting? And again, this is an indictment, not on the heathen, not on the people that are far from God. These are the people who saw the miracles. Notice what it says. Much to the amusement of their enemies. Much to the amusement of their enemies. And basically, if I was to paraphrase, what a joke. 
What a joke. These people should know better. They were there. They were in bondage. They asked for a deliverer. God sends a deliverer. There are these plagues. There are the, the displays of power. And God righteously, supremely, sovereignly shows up and breaks them out of the house of bondage, out of bondage, and gives them a promise of the promised land. And as he's leading them, he takes them through the Red Sea and the sea parts. There are things that have been done that are unprecedented, and these people were there to witness it with their own eyes. And now, much to the amusement of their enemies, they're saying, we don't know what happened to Moses, and we don't know what happened to the God that we thought we knew, but check out this golden calf, because this is the calf, and this is the, uh, this is the God that led us out of Egypt. Folks, hear me tonight. And again, in my convoluted way, the way that I see things, this ultimately is the picture of what happens with my truth. What my truth does, it casts something in the form of your own personal golden calf, and then you begin to claim that that golden calf, that American idol, that truth now is the very thing that is leading you. When it's been the hand of God, the heart of God, and the hope of God that has brought you to this particular point. Amen. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> Exodus 32, 25, all of you who are on the Lord's side, come over and join me, and all the Levites gathered around me. In conclusion tonight, I'm almost done. Hang on. In conclusion, I read this article. While I was sitting at my desk Monday morning, thinking, what am I going to say on Wednesday night? I got nothing. I got nothing. It's like a Seinfeld episode. Can I have a sermon about nothing? I, I don't know. And I, I'm pulling up Bible Gateway on my computer, and as I'm doing it, this headline jumps out at me, and it said, man showing off with snake wrapped around his neck gets bitten to death. <laughs> so I read the article. This guy was a local living legend in this town in India. And he was known as the local guru when it comes to capturing snakes. And anybody had a, 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 a dangerous snake, a poisonous snake situation, any kind of snake, this was your guy. So much so that he had captured over 200 snakes successfully in his town. But on this one occasion, he takes this, cake, this snake, wraps it around his neck, dancing around like a fool, and the next thing you know, the very snake that's wrapped around his neck, thinking that he is the ultimate snake charmer, is bitten, and he dies within 60 minutes. And I thought, somehow, that's going to work its way into my sermon on, <laughs> on Wednesday night. I'm not sure how, but that's a great headline. Here's how it works in. Sna Satan shows up in the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent and says to Eve, has God indeed said, and begins to, to disparage and begins to cast doubt on the word of God, the truth of God. And begins to say, listen, you don't have to listen to those things. And ultimately, because Eve and Adam listen to that, that's how sin entered to the world. They're cast out, out of the garden. And in many ways, I think this is exactly what has happened to people that are buying into this notion that my truth, it's like that snake. It's a lie from the pit of hell. That you can just serve whatever truth you think is okay, and you can wrap it around your neck, and you think that it might be a necklace, you think that it's a garland, you think that it's some type of accessory. The problem is that accessory is going to bite you in the neck, and it's going to steal, kill, and destroy the very life of you. How do you like that segue? So let me conclude tonight with just a few of my truths. I say, I thought you were against it. Well, bear with me. And these are just a few of my truths. Here's one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's one of my truths. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's one of my truths. Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, 
my God in him I will trust. That's one of my truths. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. This is a verse 20 plus years ago, 30 plus years ago. Where's the time go? In 1992, 30 years ago, I had to learn in master's commission. They gave us 20 verses to start out with, and then we were, we were required to search out another 380 and memorize 400 that year. But among the first 20 that they gave us was this one in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and though there be no fe- and though the fields yield no, f- no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and the, there, there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. For the record, I had to practice saying that because every time I said it, I made it sound like I was saying my high heels. And that's not my truth. (laughs) Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Acts 20, this is Paul speaking. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of Christ. These are some of my truths, but I finished intentionally with this one with Paul in Acts chapter 20 where he said that I may finish my race. number of years ago, over 30 years ago now, I watched a documentary on the 100 greatest moments of the modern day Olympics when they were reinstituted in 1896. Bud Greenspan was the narrator that day and I was captivated so much so that after I watched it over 30 years ago out, I went out and bought the book and read the book on the 100 greatest moments and one of my favorite stories. And I know that I've told this story here before and I'm going to abbreviate it for time tonight. It happened in the 1968 Olympics that were held in Mexico City, which in itself presented a a variety of problems because of the high altitudes and the athletes that did not acclimate properly. It just gave them all kinds of fits in terms of showing up and being at their particular best. And the, the athletes that were really kind of intuitive, they got there early so they could acclimate to the high altitudes and everything else. One of, the, one of the stories that was really gaining the most traction internationally had to do with the marathon because the previous gold medal winner from Rome and from Japan was from Ethiopia, and they were wondering, would it be the first time that there could be a, 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 a three-peat? It's never been done before. And it was, it was a groundbreaking story, and every, all eyes were upon the marathon race, this great runner, this previous twice gold medal winner from Ethiopia. But about 17 kilometers in, about 10 and a half miles in, he bowed out of the race because three, for the previous three weeks he had injured himself. He didn't tell anybody, but his running companion, who, who was really being mentored by this great gold medalist, Something inspired him, and he ran like he had never run before, and it ends up winning the gold medal, and he dedicates the gold medal to his mentor, the great past gold medal winner from the previous two Olympics. That's not what the story that captivated me. There was a runner from, from Tanzania, John Stephen Akawari. Nobody gave him a chance. Nobody thought he was going to podium. Nobody thought he might finish in the top 10, but he wasn't going to... He, wasn't, he certainly wasn't going for gold, certainly wasn't going for silver, certainly wasn't going for bronze. And it was the first time that his country had sent someone 
from, his, from Tanzania that had made the Olympic trials and was qualified and made the times and everything else. But somewhere along the race, his body began to break down for reasons that he did not understand. And every step that he began to take out, his body began to physically bleed out. And he tried his best to bandage himself up with his socks and different things, and he would rip things and try to do tourniquets, but he was bleeding out and he was hobbling along. Finally, after everything is done and the, the, the medals are given out and the crowd is left, and if I remember correctly, the, the stadium in Mexico City could seat over 100,000 people and there were a couple of thousand people still remaining in the, in the stadium. Just kind of hanging out. And, but in, a, in, a, in an auditorium that seats 100,000, 2,000 are there, it's pretty sparsely populated. And they notice the silhouette that's walking in, basically hobbling in through this tunnel. And the cameras actually turn because they're intrigued and they're like, because they could see the number on the guy. And then they again put it together. It's, oh, it's the runner. It's John Stephen Akawari from... Tanzania, doesn't he know that the marathon finished over two and a half hours ago? What is this man still doing? And he's coming in and he's coming through and they're thinking, he's probably here just to get his belongings. He's probably here. But he comes in and in order to complete the marathon, you had to do a full circle around the track. You weren't done. It wasn't like you came through the tunnel and there, boom, you stopped. You had to come in and do a complete circle around the track. And then when you completed the, the full circle around the track, you were done the race. And so now the 2,000 people and the camera crew, and they're filming this guy, and he's hobbling along. He's bleeding from his body. And they're like, what in the world? And there's silence. There's 2,000 people there, but you could have heard a pin drop. And he makes his way around the track, and he crosses the finish line, and he falls to the ground. He's completely depleted. He's completely spent. And they're looking at him. And, and finally, I, and people are just stunned. They're like, what are we witnessing here today? Finally, somebody goes to him. They kind of, kind of awaken to the, to the moment. And they go to him. And they're like, bro, what, 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 what? you, 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 you kind of tanked at mile 17. You've been going for the last nine. What, 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 like, why? Everyone's done. Everything's completed. The medals are given out. But not only that, there's nobody here. There's nobody here from your team. There's nobody here that, that was in, in the competition. You're here all by yourself. What is your deal? What he said is something that I've never forgotten. And it's something that I personally hold as a core value for Todd Matchett as a follower of Christ, as a preacher of the gospel, as a husband, as a father, as a soon-to-be grandfather, praise the Lord, as a friend, as, as just, as just, as, as just as a dude. What he said was that my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start a marathon. My country sent me 7,000 miles to finish one. To finish one. Go ahead and stand with me at this time. I finished with that story intentionally tonight because I, I want to leave you encouraged. Because there will be times when you're defending and contending for the truth of God where it will feel like in this life you're getting beaten up and beaten down. That the race that you are running, it's almost too much for you to bear. And it can feel like emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise. Like you're bleeding out with every step that you take. But hear me tonight, and I believe it's the heart of God tonight. Our Heavenly Father did not send His Son and take your place and my place on a cross so that you would start this marathon. Jesus Christ took your place and my place on that cross so that we would finish one. Can somebody say amen? Amen. How will you finish? I read a book a number of years ago called Finishing Strong, and at the first part of the book, it was really written to pastors, but I could broaden it out tonight. But he said about pastors, and I heard Pastor Tommy reference this book years ago, so I bought it. But he did this study, and in a study that he conducted of these pastors that he watched over a lifetime, only one in ten finish strong. Nine out of ten pastors 
Well, maybe they finished. They didn't finish strong. I want to finish strong. Lift your hands with me tonight. Heavenly Father, tonight we just take this moment to acknowledge that we will build our lives on the truth of the Word of God. We're not going to take a poll. We're not going to side with popular opinion. We're not going to wrestle with, I wonder what, who's saying this and who's saying that. God, help us to go to the source of all truth, the fountain of all truth. Help us, Lord, to build and stake our lives on the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will abide forever. And God, help us, Jesus, that when we find ourselves weary and well-doing, when we find ourselves bleeding out on the race course or on the battlefield, God, help us, Lord, to continue to contend, continue to continue, to keep on keeping on. And be like Paul where he said, none of these things move me. Even when he was aware that in the next city there was going to be beatings and whippings and not a warm welcome whatsoever, he said, none of these things move me. My hope and my heart is this that I may finish my race with joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength and help us to leave this place tonight encouraged by your word. We ask this, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. Amen.